Texas had been at the center of American expansionary goals for quite some time prior to the 1840s. After the Panic of 1819, Moses Austin approached the Spanish government about settling a colony of Anglos in what was then northern New Spain, what is now Texas. The Spanish government agreed, trying to create a loyal group of citizens as a buffer against future filibusters. After the death of Moses Austin, his son Stephen F. Austin took over the colonization project and succeeded in settling a colony of Anglos along what is now the Texas Gulf Coast. Through the 1820s and then the early 1830s, tensions continued to grow between the Mexican government and the American settlers in Texas principally over the issue of slavery, which Stephen F. Austin and others wanted to ex expand into Texas, in which they did expand into Texas, uh, even though the practice was against Mexican law. Ultimately, of course, this resulted in a rebellion against the Mexican government on the part of the Anglo settlers, and this conflict, known as the Texas Revolution, really ended up being the most successful filibuster carried out by Americans in the 19th century. By the time of the Battle of San Jacinto in April of 1836 that decided the, the conflict, 90% of Sam Houston's Texas army had been in Texas from the United States less than three months. Now, even though the Republic of Texas wanted to annex themselves to the United States, there was a great deal of controversy over that, over that issue because of slavery. Now, Andrew Jackson did his old friend Sam Houston a favor when he diplomatically recognized Texas, the Republic of Texas, just before he left office. But President Martin Van Buren did not want to annex Texas, again, because of the slavery issue. The abolitionist movement was peaking in the United States at that time. William Lloyd Garrison famously said, quote, all who sympathize with the pseudo-republic hate liberty and would dethrone God. So, clearly, Texas is off the table for Van Buren. But Texas reemerged as a serious issue during the presidency of John Tyler. John Tyler, of course, had become president in April of 1841 after the death of President William Henry Harrison. But in 1841, John Tyler th showed his true colors to the Whig Party when he vetoed a recharter of the Bank of the United States that Henry Clay had pushed through the Congress. And at that point, the Whigs turned on Tyler and began backing Clay for the presidency in 1844. Now, Tyler needed an issue to run on in 1844, and he chose the annexation of Texas. Tyler had his Secretary of State, Abel Upshur, begin annexation negotiations Upshur was key in this regard, but then in February of 1844, Upshur was killed in the worst naval accident in the history of the United States when a large cannon exploded aboard the USS Princeton as they were testing the cannon in the Potomac River. And so... This is, you can see pictured here, Secretary of State Abel Upshur before his untimely death. And now Tyler had to find another way to try to annex Texas before his time as president came to an end. The phrase manifest destiny did not come into use until 1845. And the phrase was coined in reference to the annexation of Texas. A writer coined the phrase, 
to essentially say that it was manifestly or obviously the will of God that the United States should expand across the entire North American continent. And this phrase of manifest destiny then became popularized particularly in the Democratic Party and in particular in relation to the annexation of Texas. John Tyler replaced Abel Upshur as Secretary of State with John C. Calhoun, perhaps the biggest pro-slavery advocate the U.S. Congress had ever seen. And Calhoun pressed forward with a treaty of annexation drawn up by Upshur. But then a letter leaked between Calhoun and the British ambassador Pakenham in which Calhoun explicitly linked Texas, the annexation of Texas with spreading slavery into the Southwest. And as a result, the U.S. Senate had to have open debates on the treaty. And in this presidential election year, the Senate defeated the treaty by a vote of 35 to 16 in June of 1844. So once again, it, appear, it appears that annexation is dead. But in some ways, Calhoun is playing a game behind the scenes here in which he is hoping to get a pro-annexation Democrat to run for the presidency in 1844 instead of the presumptive nominee, which most people assumed at that time would be Martin Van Buren. In the 1844 presidential campaign, the nominees or presumptive nominees of both parties, Henry Clay and Martin Van Buren, both came out against the annexation of Texas because of the slavery issue. And Van Buren rejecting Texas opened the door for a dark horse candidate, James K. Polk of Tennessee, Speaker of the U.S. House, Young Hickory, as he was known, political protege of Andrew Jackson, and Polk won the Democratic nomination for president in 1844, and Polk campaigned on the twin promises of annexing Texas and for the free states of annexing the Oregon Territory. The Oregon Territory at that time, which is now the states of Oregon, Washington, and Idaho, was in dispute. It was in dispute with Great Britain. And so, but of course, American settlers had been streaming out to the Oregon Territory along the Oregon Trail in the 1840s and had a strong settlement in the Willamette Valley. And so Polk promised voters that if they elected him for president, he would annex both Texas and Oregon. And these campaign promises worked. James K. Polk won the presidency in 1844 over Henry Clay. And Polk, when he was elected, promised to only serve one term as president. And in that term, he promised to annex Texas, annex Oregon, and expand the United States all the way to the Pacific. Now, Polk is often remembered as our hardest working president. And in fact, he probably was. Polk entered into negotiations with both Mexico and Great Britain over the territories in question. Britain finally agreed to the 49th parallel in June of 1845 as far as the Oregon Territory. That was not as much of a territory as Polk had wanted to annex, but it was an acceptable compromise for him. Meanwhile, in December of 1844, before he left office, President John Tyler had gone back to the Congress and suggested that instead of passing a treaty, they should pass a joint resolution of Congress, which requires a simple majority vote in both houses to annex Texas. The Congress, seeing the 1844 presidential election results as a national mandate to annex Texas, passed the joint resolution of, of Congress to annex Texas, and Tyler 
signed it and sent it to the Republic of Texas just before he left office. Polk, of course, continued, and on July 4th, 1845, the Congress of the Republic of Texas agreed to the joint resolution and sent it back to the United States. And then in December of 1845, President Polk signed the Admission of Texas Act. But there was a problem with that. Mexico had promised that if the United States annexed Texas, that Mexico would consider it an act of war. Mexico still regarded Texas as a renegade province. And Polk, of course, largely ignored them in their threats. And in addition, when the United States annexed Texas, they accepted Texas's boundary claims which were very different from the boundary claims of Mexico. As you'll see on the map that I'm going to show you in a moment, Texas, the state of Texas within Mexico, had never been anything but a smaller version of what Texas now claimed. And so Mexico regarded Texas as one size, and the Republic of Texas and the United States regarded Texas as much larger. That is going to lead the United States into a war with Mexico. This is the Electoral College vote of 1844, in which you can see Polk beating out Clay by a wide margin. This is the Oregon Territory, as it was delineated in the 1840s, Polk had promised to annex all the way up to the 5440 parallel, which, if he had been successful, would have taken in all of Vancouver and that area of what is now Canada. But instead, Polk settled for the 49th parallel, you can see there, uh, which is now the 49th parallel is now the northern boundary of the state of Washington. And so the United States got about half of the Oregon Territory. Uh, but this is the Oregon Territory that was in dispute in the 1840s. And here you can see the problem with Texas. That Lone Star flag there is Texas as it had always existed under Mexican law. Meanwhile, the territory in red to the south and the west, the territory of New Mexico, uh, the United States and the Republic of Texas both claimed that that was also a part of Texas. So you can see the issue. Uh, if Mexico were to give in, they would not only lose Texas, but they would lose big parts of their states of Chihuahua, Coahuila, Taumalipas, uh, and Nueva Mexico. So uh, this is the boundary dispute here. And by the way, if Texas were still this large today, Texas would be 45% larger than it is even now. After the annexation of Texas in the fall of 1845, Polk sent Louisiana politician John Slidell, who was fluent in Spanish, to Mexico City. Uh, Slidell was not there to apologize for the actions of the U.S. government, but in fact he was there to offer Mexico up to, a, up to $25 million for their territory of Alta California, which you can see there on the map in gray that I just showed you. Needless to say, Mexico was even angrier than they were before, and they rejected the Slidell mission. But in order to strengthen Slidell's bargaining position, Polk sent a U.S. Army under General Zachary Taylor across the Nueces River into the disputed territory. Taylor and his army camped on the south side of the Nueces. And then as the Slidell mission grew even more dire, Taylor and his men advanced all the way to the north bank of the Rio Grande. Meanwhile, there was a small skirmish 
between U.S. and Mexican cavalry on the north side of the Rio Grande, and this was all the excuse that Polk wanted. Polk had already begun preparing a war message when news of the Battle of Palo Alto reached him. Palo Alto, of course, was the first major battle of the U.S.-Mexican War. Uh, a Mexican army under General Pedro Ampudia had attempted to cut Taylor and his men off from their supplies at Port Isabel, Texas. And so Taylor and his men fought them at the Battle of Palo Alto on April 24, 1846, and won. You can see here pictured General Zachary Taylor. Uh, he was known to his men as old rough and ready, uh, cared nothing for pomp and circumstance. As a result of the Battle of Palo Alto and the other skirmish on May 11, 1846, Polk asked Congress to declare war on Mexico, and two days later, on May 13, Congress did in fact declare war on Mexico. This is the beginning of the U.S.-Mexican War, a war that would see the United States conquer Mexico and then take more than half of Mexico's national territory from that country. You can see here the image on the upper right is a photograph of a cannon on the Palo Alto National Battlefield today in South Texas, and on the bottom left is an artist's depiction of the battle. You gotta love how the artist inserted mountains in the background. If you've ever been down to South Texas to that area, you know that that is some of the flattest land you will ever see, and there are no mountains for hundreds and hundreds of miles. Meanwhile, Polk dispatched other U.S. troops to try to conquer Alta California, even as Taylor and his army advanced into northern Mexico. John C. Fremont, the Pathfinder, had led a group of the U.S. Corps of Topographical Engineers into Oregon in December of 1845, and when news of the outbreak of the U.S.-Mexican War reached him, he raced south. In June of 1846, a group of 30 rebels near what is now San Francisco declared their independence from Mexico and what was known as the Bear Flag Revolt. And to this day, the California state flag pictures the Bear Flag and still says California Republic on it. Fremont arrived shortly after the Bear Flag Revolt and he, in conjunction with the U.S. Navy, which occupied the deep water ports on the California coast, uh, lost a total of about 30 soldiers in conquering what is now California. Meanwhile, General Stephen Kearney led 1,700 U.S. troops into what is now New Mexico, Santa Fe, and then Kearney moved on to occupy Southern California on the deep water port at San Diego. In 1847, Mexican residents in Taos did rise up in rebellion against the U.S. occupying troops during the U.S.-Mexican War, and uh, the United States Army brutally put down the rebellion at Taos. Uh, but the campaigns by Fremont and Kearney helped the United States to take uh, what is now the Western United States. General Zachary Taylor and his men pursued the, re the retreating Mexican army toward the city of Monterrey, Mexico. And on the 20th of September, U.S. troops stormed the walls of Monterrey and began fighting house to house, street to street through Monterrey. On the 24th of September, General Ampudia decided to negotiate with Taylor and he negotiated a two-month armistice. In exchange for the armistice, Ampudia and his men would be allowed to march south, and Taylor would be given the city. After President Polk learned of this armistice, he was furious. He claimed that Taylor had no right to conduct the armistice. 
only to kill the enemy. And so this stalled Taylor's campaign in northern Mexico. Another concern of Taylor's was his supply lines. If you see on the map, Taylor's supplies had to come from Port Isabel. And so the further south he advanced into Mexico, the more exposed his supply lines became. And this became a major concern for him. And so temporarily the U.S. campaign to conquer Mexico stalled around Monterey. You can see here a map of the U.S.-Mexican War. Kearney's troops moving out towards San Diego. Uh, Taylor's troops down to Monterey. But you can also see that after the armistice following the Battle of Monterey, President Polk decided to open a second front of the war. And he decided in January of 1847 to dispatch most of Taylor's troops down to Tampico to link up with General Winfield Scott, who was coming with a smaller force from New Orleans. These troops under Scott at Tampico and Veracruz were then were at Tampico were then to land at Veracruz and begin marching inland on Mexico City, taking the same route the Spanish had in 1519. In January 1847, President Polk ordered most of Taylor's troops to link up with Scott at Veracruz, which left Taylor weakened in northern Mexico. Santa Ana, the president of Mexico and commander of Mexican forces in the field, intercepted a communication learning of these moves and moved to attack a weakened Taylor near Buena Vista, south of Saltillo. There on February 22nd and 23rd, the two sides fought one of the fiercest battles of the war. And on the 23rd of February 1847, just as Mexican troops were about to break through Taylor's lines and destroy the Americans, Santa Ana got word of a coup against him in Mexico City, and he broke off contact with the battle, rushed back to Mexico City, but this allowed Taylor to claim it as a victory. Taylor became known as the hero of the Battle of Buena Vista, and this would be Taylor's ticket to political fortune and fame after the end of the U.S.-Mexican War. Meanwhile, General Winfield Scott, known to his men as Old Fuss and Feathers, had designed one of the most daring amphibious operations in the annals of U.S. military history. U.S. troops under Scott landed at Veracruz under the fire of cannon from a nearby Mexican fort, but the U.S. Navy was able to silence the fort enough for the troops to be able to land, as you can see depicted here. They laid siege to the city of Veracruz on March 9th, and after a three-week siege, captured the city on the 29th of March, 1847, and from there, Scott began moving inland toward Mexico City. In the mountains west of Veracruz, Santa Ana designed a very strong defensive position near Cerro Gordo, but U.S. troops managed to find a way to flank the position. And on the morning of April 9, 1847, U.S. troops uh, attacked the flank of Santa Ana's position and routed the Mexican troops out of their stronghold and Santa Ana was forced to flee the battlefield so precipitously that he left behind his wooden leg. It was one of two wooden legs that he had constructed for himself. Santa Ana had lost his leg to a French cannonball during the Pastry War in 1837. And after that, he had replaced his leg with these wooden legs they were not functional as the prosthetic but they did fill out your pant leg nicely when mounted on a horse the fourth illinois infantry captured santa Ana's leg and they took it back with them to illinois as a prize of war and to this day there is controversy about where santa Ana's leg should be 
Mexico has asked for it back as one of their national treasures. Illinois has said no. There are some Texans who want it brought to the Alamo for reasons that are totally strange and bizarre. But nevertheless, the leg remains today in Springfield, Illinois, under the care of the Illinois State Armory Museum. Scott decided not to attack Mexico City from the east as the defenses were too strong. He decided to swing his army around to the southwest of the city. And so in that endeavor, U.S. troops fought and defeated Mexican forces in several battles, starting with the Battle of Contreras on August 19, 1847, and then the Battle of Churubusco the next day on the 20th of August, 1847. Here is a, a depiction of the Battle of Molino del Rey on the 8th of September 1847 as Scott completed his swing around to the southwest of Mexico City and began preparing to attack Castle Chapultepec. Chapultepec Castle or Chapultepec Palace guarded the southwestern approaches to Mexico City. It stood upon a high imposing hill it, was al it also served as the Mexican National Military Academy at that point. On the 13th of September 1847, though, the U.S. troops managed to scale the, scale the tall hill up to Chapultepec, scale the walls, and in one of the great tragedies of the war, several of the young Mexican military cadets at Chapultepec flung themselves over the wall to their deaths rather than surrender in the in the final battle for the castle and a monument marks their bravery today in castle chapultepec which you can still visit if you travel to mexico city you can see here on the left a monument to the six cadets who flung themselves over the wall to their deaths ages 13 to 19 and on the right, here is an aerial view of Castle Chapultepec in Mexico City today. You can see the difficulty of the American troops in scaling the hill and the walls. And, of course, why the cadets uh, died when they flung themselves over the walls. The final battle for Mexico City occurred on the 13th and 14th of September 1847. U.S. forces occupied the city on the 15th of September. The image here is the triumphal entry of Major General Winfield Scott into the Central Plaza. And although it's not clearly visible in this image, by this time, the stars and stripes were already flying over the National Cathedral there in the background. President Polk had dispatched Nicholas Trist, the chief clerk of the U.S. State Department, with Scott on his campaign. But at the end of the war, Trist could find no one to negotiate a peace with. The Mexican government was in tatters. They had all scattered. And Polk ordered Trist to return to Washington. Trist, though, disobeyed his orders. And finally, in late January 1848, he found a faction of the Mexican government hiding out in the village of Guadalupe Hidalgo near Mexico City. He negotiated a treaty and an end to the war with this faction. And he offered them $15 million dollars for the territory of Alta California, the same territory that Slidell had been negotiating for back in 1845. And when he returned to Washington with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, Polk was angry with him for offering Mexico any money for the territory, but Polk submitted the treaty to the U.S. Senate, and the U.S. Senate after a debate about whether or not to annex all of Mexico. Ultimately, the U.S. did not annex all of Mexico because of racism. John C. Calhoun 
pointed out that if they were to annex all of Mexico, it would annex all Mexicans with it. And so racism actually saved the United States from annexing all of Mexico. But the U.S. Senate did approve the treaty by a vote of 38 to 14 on March 10th, 1848. And this created the Mexican Session. The area highlighted in light here is what was known as the Mexican Session. And that area there south of the Gila River, south of Phoenix, was actually part of a separate purchase from Mexico known as the Gadsden Purchase in the 1850s. And that was when uh, the United States was attempting to build a transcontinental railroad and Southerners wanted that what is now Southern Arizona and New Mexico to build the railroad through. And so that's why that was not an initial part of the Mexican session. As you can see though, the U.S.-Mexican War secured for the United States what is now the states of California, Nevada, Utah, most of what is now Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Wyoming. One thing to note at the outset of the conclusion of the U.S.-Mexican War is that Mexico uh, never regarded the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo as valid. Certainly, they have good reason for that. But, just a few months into the war, a dispute over slavery reared its ugly head in the U.S. Congress. Representative David Wilmot, a Democrat from Pennsylvania, introduced what was called the Wilmot Proviso on August 8, 1846. And the Wilmot Proviso stated that slavery should never exist in any territory that might be gained from Mexico as a result of this current war. Of course, the U.S. Congress did not pass the Wilmot Proviso, but there were enough votes for it that they continued to attempt to attach it to spending bills. And so in this way, it was a foreshadowing of civil war. Before the war was even completed, debates about whether or not slavery should expand into this new territory had already been raised in the Congress. And as one politician put it, when they ratify the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, Mexico will poison us. Mexico will poison us. And he was correct. The dispute over whether or not slavery should exist in these territories is the dispute that led directly to the outbreak of civil war 13 years later.